Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask GN. As always, if you have questions, leave them in the comments section below. I'll try to get to them for the next episode. We're trying to do one of these per week now, pretty consistent lately. So before getting to this episode, which has a couple of pretty interesting CPU and GPU questions, this content is brought to you by Rosewell and their Cullinan case, which is right here. I just revisited this as an aside to the 570X and 270R, the two new Corsair cases that we reviewed on Monday, which is the day of filming for this, but uh, we talked about those and revisited this in that coverage. This is a tempered glass case, tempered glass on the side and on the front, and also on the right side from the perspective of the camera. It's got a tint to it, which some of the other cases don't, and then as far as price, it's on sale this week for $120, so that's a pretty significant drop from the original $150 asking price. If you're curious, the original uh, vendor of this case actually also makes the Anadis AI Crystal. So you've seen the AI Crystal, which for a brief while was one of really the only new tempered glass cases on the market right after Computex, after this was shown, they came out with theirs. And they actually come from the same source. They're both from Jonesboat, which is a uh, sort of OEM designer company. And they put together a lot of cases like this. So really it comes down to the logo that's in it and then things like warranty and price, which right now this one's cheaper. So that's the sponsor. First question this time is, uh, shoot, I don't have the, oh, this is from an older video, but I finally got an answer to it. So I, I don't have the commenter's name written down, but they asked, hey, Steve, I just wanted to know if there's any particular reason for AMD to stick with the PGA style of stock sockets for AM4 instead of LGA. So this question was asked a while ago. Thought it was a pretty interesting question. I sent it over to AMD and had them uh, paint a few different people internally and figure it out. So the, the feedback, the answer from the technical marketing team, which is the only group that really provided an answer, is as follows, direct quote, PGA packages generally provide a thicker processor package that is more resistant to bending under the forces of a mounted heat sink. PGA sockets are also less expensive than LGA sockets, which can help reduce the cost of a motherboard. And uh, for those of you who don't know, basically the options LGA is what Intel pretty much uses for every socketed CPU, well, does use for every socketed CPU, the alternative being something that's soldered to a board, which is not really applicable here. They use LGA, that's where the pins are in the board in a socket, and the CPU just has the contacts on it. With AMD's processors, as many of you likely know, the processor itself has the pins, like AMD's saying, it's a thicker package of the processor as a result of that. Uh, but the motherboard is now less prone to potential damage like bent pins. So the motherboard socket, uh, basically the pins feed into a cluster of, of the holes for the pins. And then there's the contacts underneath hidden under a plastic protective and mounting layer. So that's the socketing setup for both devices and AMD uses PGA. And their answer to me it was that it's just because of the resistant to heat sink bending and that the cost is lower. Both valid answers. So I, I didn't get more than that, but that's that's what we got for now. Next question is from Smokey Dops five oh Smokey Dops five days ago. It says I have a typical AMD versus NVIDIA question regarding releases of different GPU architectures. With NVIDIA's 10 series of GPUs, we are seeing releases of GP 107, 106, 104, and 102. Do these represent different architectures or unique dyes? Or do they represent the common adage of flagship architecture with components on die that failed quality assurance? Question goes on for a bit, but that was the, the basics of it. So this is kind of referring to, for those who don't know, instances where you end up with a product that is a, or was originally meant to be a higher end product and has been sort of uh, locked or restricted because it failed in some ways validation. It's not 100% how it works with GPUs. That is how it works in some places. An example would be some of the older AMD GPUs you could actually unlock and get some more power out of them. And that was really more of a thing where uh, there was demand for a certain type of product more than another. And so AMD would release more of those to fill the demand. And that's that's kind of how it works in general. This also happens elsewhere in the industry, but for GPUs specifically, this is another one where I reached out to the vendor. So uh, asked NVIDIA, you know, the obvious thing to kind of point out here is that when you look at the cards, like this is uh, 
the EVGA FTW that we've been working on for VRM temps that's got a couple thermal probes still s attached to it with adhesive. When you look at that die, the die package is a pretty visually different size from what you would see. That's a 1080, for example, on a 1050 Ti. GP107 is much smaller. Uh, so in that regard, if this concept were true, what would happen is you'd see something like this, a GP104 or whatever 102 package in its full large size being placed onto something like a 1050 Ti and then it would be more limited in its performance, but the die would look the same size as that. That's obviously not how it works. You've all seen the teardowns, at least the ones that we've done, if not elsewhere, and they're pretty obvious smaller size as you go down the listing, the tiering of cards. So then, what happens? Well, when I reached out to NVIDIA, they basically said for their cards, uh, their GPUs specifically, if they are underperforming or if they for some reason don't function just from normal, Yield, yield is not 100% perfect for really any electronic device, especially silicon. So there's always something that fails, and what happens is they recycle them somehow. So it's not in a product as far as I know, uh, but recycle them as in normal recycling where you try to reuse stuff. And I actually, go off camera somewhat, have one that I just remembered. Uh, I got this years ago. I think it's got the GPU identifiers rubbed off of it, but this is a failed... NVIDIA GPU, and I got this at their silicon failure analysis lab. We toured it probably 2013 or something. And the guy there is pretty uh, pretty damn smart, was talking about how all of their equipment's used, like um, scanning electron microscopes and things like that, and magnifying uh, silicon to 1.5 million X. So they could like mill a hole into the surface, mill a hole down into it and look at almost basically a transistor level what's going on when something fails. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, but I got this from him, and uh, it's basically from Howard Marks, his name. So it's a failed chip. In this case, they just have a bucket of them and give them out to visitors. So that would be one place to reuse, as opposed to, again, in a lower tier card. Uh, so I hope that answers that question. There are places where parts are uh, I won't use the word recycled because it's confusing, but are reused in a lower tier product. But the current series of GPUs is not one of them with the 10 series. I did ask, and I'm waiting on a response, what about the GTX 1060s? Because there's two SKUs of 1060s. So uh, in that specific case, it's a little unique because a 1060, you've got the base model and then the 1063 gigabyte model, which has 10% fewer SMs. So the question is, 10% fewer SMs, is it a higher SKU, is it a 1066 gigabyte that's been restricted, or is this a separate line in manufacturing that's producing these 10% lower SM count chips specifically for the three gigabyte cards? Haven't received an answer to that yet, but I only asked a couple hours before the video, so. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Wesley Runyon says, Steve, why is it the different benchmarks ultimately give different answers. For instance, Passmark versus Firestrike. Passmark rates my score with a 1070 from MSI Gaming Z better than a 1080 or even a Titan XP. Then very similar PCs with less speed, RAM, clock, CDC outperform mine. Is it possible to cheat the system or software? Yeah, yeah, I know. Turn off all the background apps, et cetera, et cetera. Not buying it, temps, blah, blah. Not cutting it either. That's kind of rolling over a lot of what we do. Uh, I monitor my hardware closely, and that excuse is nonsensical. I am curious to see what your opinion is of synthetic benchmarks. Uh, so synthetic benchmarks are, tr are tough. Even just 3 d Mark on the same system, ignore all the other systems you're talking about or cards, you run it a few times on the same system, there is variance. And that can be the difference between a card with one clock uh, trading places with a card with another clock, and that's a problem. So. Uh, there's a reason we don't use 3D Mark scores in our reviews. That may change at some point, but right now I just don't like the variance in it. And I don't like the idea that I have to run it several times to average an answer that seems reasonable because it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's extra work and it makes more sense for me anyway to spend that time benchmarking another game instead. because so we can spend that time doing that. Uh, but that's 3D Mark. So pass mark. Things, once you start mixing and matching tools, you really can't look at these things outside of their vacuum that they're in. So like Passmark, 3D Mark, Furmark, they really are not meant to be compared one against the other when you're looking at scores. It's sort of 
look at it in a vacuum, everything pass mark, everything 3D mark, whatever. Uh, as far as why your card might outperform others, I don't, I don't know specifically what you're looking at, but like I said, because the tools are so different, it could actually be the case that there's a difference in memory or in the memory clock on the GPU or something like that, well, that might actually be significant to the particular tool that you're using. An example of this would be Furmark. Furmark and Combustor, the MSI benchmarking tool, Combustor contains variants of Furmark that are branded by MSI. I find them to be a bit more abusive. Furmark is, behaves like a power virus. It burns the VRM. So basically, that's what I've been using on this thing. It sort of sits there and incinerates the VRM. Um, to a point that is not realistic for what you would get in a game. And the testing, as you'll see this week from this card, we'll see a difference of sometimes 20 Celsius in VRM times probing the VRM, the MOSFETs directly, when using a game like Dirt Rally, Metro Last Light, any number of modern games, Battlefield, as opposed to using Furmark. Furmark always being the hotter of the two. So that's an instance where when you're comparing two different cards, temperatures do actually matter quite a lot because if you've got, uh, as a better example, maybe an AMD card where there are different throttles in place than on the NVIDIA cards, running into those temperature limits with Furmark would produce results that may look worse for a card that's cooled worse, uh, like the Sapphire Platinum Series RX 470, which is a reference cooler. That would look worse than something like maybe a Gaming X, even if both have the same everything else. Uh, and that's just because of the cooling and because of boost limitations as well. So on the 10 series cards, because of the way boost works, if it doesn't have thermal headroom, you're going to get a lower clock and that will impact your score. So uh, I, I don't know that temps blah blah not cutting it really. Uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, but also temperatures are pretty important depending on what you're testing. Now, once you're looking at the good cards like a bunch of ACX, Twin Frozer, uh, whatever else is at Strix, those types of coolers that are all pretty much always below 80 Celsius, and then the difference comes into play from things like power target and power availability. So again, uh, an example might be if you're testing overclocks or if you're even without overclocks, just because the way GPU Boost 3.0 works on NVIDIA, if you've got more power headroom because the VRM is designed to, to supply that power, like this card, we can toggle to 130% offset. And that gives us something like, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, I think it's like 245 watts total available power. Something like that anyway. Uh, that's a pretty good impact also, again, on the clock rate and on the clock stability specifically. So the clock rate may look about the same in terms of the maximum number, but the stability of that number will be greater as you reduce your thermal headroom, as you increase your power availability, and as you increase your voltage. And those three things, to some extent, are done automatically by the card. So this isn't just you going to the MSI Afterburner or whatever and changing it. Uh, in general, synthetic benchmarks are not my preferred way of testing things. Uh, to really put your question to the test, you'd have to kind of take one of each device, put it in the exact same rig and test it, because uh, you don't know how those, those tools are programmed and what they care about in terms of system resources. Uh, like again, as another fi final example, 3D Mark. If you run the full 3D Mark test, it will run a physics test in there, and that's not graphics processing physics. That's system physics processing that goes on the CPU. And so, you've got two graphics tests and one physics test. Three total test passes in 3D Mark. You're running a lower end CPU or one with a different clock, or maybe the temperature was different this time, or maybe the voltage was different this time because of all the C states and all the EIST and all this crap that's in BIOS that you have to disable to really get an accurate run-to-run -run test, something changes, your physics result could be lower, and that drags down how the card looks. And the same is true with these other tools. So uh, that would probably be your answer, I think, after going through the rest of it. But I think that gives everyone a bunch of different contingencies to consider. Next question is, by the way, that was, that was a good question because I think that is one that needs to be discussed. But next question, Peyton Pringle says, how comparable is performance sustained at SSAA or super sampling anti-aliasing at 1080 to 4K, assuming all other values are the same, i.e. game settings, computer hardware, et cetera. And then uh, Peyton Pringle goes on to elaborate that super sampling anti-aliasing is basically rendering the game at a higher resolution than sampling it down to the display resolution. 
four 1080p monitors have the same resolution as a 4K monitor. So uh, yeah, 4K monitor, if you're at 3840 by 2160, uh, something to the tune of a bit over 8 million pixels, I think, and it's the same number if you do four times 1920 by 1080 uh, in terms of raw pixel count. So um, to answer the question, which is how do they compare native 4K versus super sample, I did a test of that when DSR and VSR were first posted, the AMD and NVIDIA Tech, NVIDIA's DSR and AMD's VSR. Uh, so th those were their super their, their scaling examples where the game would be rendered at the higher resolution that you specify, which could be over the native monitor resolution, and then uh, fit to the screen. So you end up with what appears to be a higher pixel density and greater quality of image. This reflects itself mostly in things like textures. So if you look at a ground texture or a cloth on an arm and something like The Witcher 3, it's a really good example where with DSR or VSR, you'll see greater detail in that texture normally to the tune of things like uh, a, a more clear line in the fabric rather than sort of a jagged line. Or maybe you see lines and cross hatching that you couldn't really perceive before. So that's where you see it. Performance, or I should say visual quality, when we took screenshots side by side years ago, uh, they looked pretty much the same. I'm not sure if that's changed. I don't think it has. But back last time I tested it, they did look in terms of like one screenshot, 1080p sampled, uh, rendered at 4K down, sampled to 1080p screens, whatever, versus a native 4K screen, they looked about the same. Um, so I, I haven't actually used as a user DSR or VSR. I always just use the native resolution, but uh, I'm sure there are good reasons to use either one. It's just not something that I've done. Um, but it also depends on what kind of hardware you have. So if you end up with, this is a good use case, if you buy, say, you want a 1070, 1080, whatever now, or even an RX 480, and you have a 1080p display, with a 480 and up, all three of those devices, you could easily do 1440p. So no harm in rendering the game at 1440p and fitting it to your 1080p display. It will look like there's greater pixel density and quality will improve, detail will improve mostly. So. Uh, hopefully that answers that. Basically the answer is they looked pretty much the same to me last time I tested it, which was a few years ago. And also the, the scaling performance was about the same as well. They're within a percentage point or, or less. I think 0.1% in one test. Uh, last question is this? Yes. <laughs> Let's Get Techie asks, Steve, have you ever considered growing a beard? Maybe not a full-blown hillbilly beard, but a beard nonetheless. I think it would match your hair like a boss, hashtag beard life. I'm going to stand very still so that Andrew can mask in a beard on my face and we'll see how it looks. And hopefully it is a full grown hillbilly beard. So thank you for watching. I will see you all next time. I'm going to remain right here so that the mask doesn't break. And uh, subscribe for more Patreon, link the postal video. See you next time.